Sergeant, please start your recordings. PC started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Sergeant Bignando, please begin with your opening statement. Sure, good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Higher Education. Once again, at this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. And to minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Barron. We are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining the Committee on Higher Education for this very important remote hearing on returning to CUNY's campuses in the wake of COVID-19. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alum. And thank you for everyone who is here to testify today. After nearly a year and a half of working and learning remotely, CUNY, like the rest of the city, is gradually returning to in-person activity. While New Yorkers have shown the strength and resilience our city is known for over the past few months, the pandemic also exposed systemic failures and widened existing racial and socioeconomic inequities. More than 33,000 of our neighbors lost their lives and many more loved ones lost their many more lost their loved ones and their livelihoods. Now it is our responsibility to address the city's failures, to institute best practices, and to build a future that honors our losses, a city where we can all thrive. It is for this reason that I was so disappointed that Hunter College High School's decision to maintain its discriminatory admissions process over the objections of students and faculty, many of whom presented strong evidence-based testimony at the, committee, at the committee's February 23rd hearing and elected officials, including myself. While other elite high schools across the country use the pandemic as an opportunity to eliminate their entrance exams and to adopt more equitable admissions standards, Hunter College High School opted to maintain the status quo. At today's hearing, we will review CUNY's plans to largely resume in-person operations in the fall after a year, more than a year of distance learning. This includes an overview of CUNY's plans for compliance with federal, state, and city guidance, universities' guidance issued to the schools, and each CUNY college's plan for a safe reopening. The committee is particularly interested in how the university plans to meet the logistical, academic, and administrative challenges of reopening, as well as any changes in student services and resources. Lastly, the committee will seek clarity around the financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, including reductions in staff, and the allocation of federal relief funds. It is imperative that CUNY's return to campus is not just about returning to business as usual. The university must be responsive to the heightened needs of its community, as well as committed closing, as well as committed closing the gaps exacerbated by the pandemic. Finally, this weekend, I was pleased to join my staff and the community in person for an annual Juneteenth event that we hold. And this was our 20th celebration of Juneteenth. As many of you may know, or have found out Juneteenth commemorates what has been said is the date that soldiers of the Union finally made their way to Galveston, Texas to announce that the enslaved Africans were so-called free. Here again, we have uh, a distortion of what actually happened. How can someone who has no jurisdiction of a territory or a geographical area make edicts and pronouncements that affect that area? It would be like Canada 
telling the United States what it could do with some of its uh, authorities and the inhabitants thereof. That was not an enslaved, there was not an announcement that had any weight, even though it took the two years to get there. And the other thing is we want to acknowledge that it were black soldiers that were a part of that whole movement of resistance that helped to free those who had been enslaved. Uh, the date again is June 19th, 1865, when that happened. And CUNY recently joined New York and the federal government in recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday. However, it has come to my attention that for thousands of CUNY employees, many of whom are black, Juneteenth, Juneteenth will be an unpaid holiday. While a paid holiday for all employees doesn't bring us closer to the reparations of the unpaid debt owed to descendants of enslaved people, I do take issue with the fact that a holiday commemorating justice unduly delayed following a summer of historic protests against police brutality that disproportionately affects black people and systemic racism would be observed at the financial expense of many of the university's black employees. I hope and expect that this will be rectified in the near future. Now in preparing for this hearing, I would like to thank Mr. Omawali Clay, my chief of staff, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation, Amy, Amy, Briggs, Amy Briggs, the committee's counsel, Chloe Rivera, the committee's senior policy analyst, Michelle Peregrine, the committee's financial analyst, and Frank Perez, the committee's community engagement representative. Additionally, I would like to thank all of the council staff, including the sergeants at arm, who are working very hard behind the scenes to make this hearing possible. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by several council members, council member Maisel and council member Rodriguez, who are members of the committee are present. Others will be acknowledged as they join. And now I will turn it over to committee council, Amy Briggs, who will review the procedural items relating to today's hearings and call the first panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Amy Briggs. I am committee counsel for the Committee on Higher Education. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute and until, until, until I call on you to testify. After you're called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up, on, call up on individuals in panels. Please listen for your name and I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait again for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from CUNY, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. For CUNY, we will have Hector Batista, who's the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Dan Lemons, Interim University Provost, and Dr. Denise Maybank, Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. I will now administer the oath to the administration when you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer Batista? I do. Thank you. University Provost Dr. Lemons. I do. Thank you. And Vice Chancellor, Dr. Maybank. I do. Alan, okay. Thank you, Dr. Maybank. Executive Vice Chancellor and, so we will begin testimony with Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, Batista. You may begin your testimony now.
Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and Good other morning. members of, and other members of the City Council of Higher Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the CUNY Fall 2021 return to more in-person activities. I am Hector Batista. I am the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer at the City University of New York. With that end, with the end of the spring semester and academic year, we are proud of the CUNY community for rising to the challenge in the middle of the global pandemic. Delivering on the university's mission to provide quality, accessible education to a diverse student body. But while our mission remains the same, many ways in which way we approach our work of academic and operation would be very different from, from now on as we, as we look at the past. From the onset of the, of the pandemic, CUNY developed a phased approach to its reopening strategy. This allowed us to be nimble and responsive to the rapidly changing guidance of public health conditions. Since the fall of 2020, all our campus has been phase one of CUNY stage reopening. We, re we represent occupancy levels up to 25%. CUNY operated in, in largely virtually modality to maintain minimum density levels on, on campus in the interest of public health and as the conditions then demanded. In preparation for the fall 2020 semester, we directed our campus to develop reopening plans in collaboration with stakeholders for our review and approval. We provided them with the, the CUNY guidelines for safe campus reopening, and along with a checklist of state requirements to inform their plans. Our guidance informed campus a detailed description of the steps they were required for a safe, mostly remote fall 2020 reopening. The Chancellor then received these plans to ensure their compliance and consistency, and we require public health safety measures. Once we approve the plans, we serve in an advisory capacity to any implementation issues that the campuses encounter. Additionally, we completed, and today we continue to complete, on-site inspections at CUNY campus to make sure that they adhere to the COVID-19 safety policy procedures. Now, as the city state head into a full reopening, we are preparing for a more in-person fall semester. With higher occupancy level on campus, and at the central office location. In January, our Chancellor, Phyllis Matos Rodriguez, announced his vision for more in-person fall 2021 semester. Several months later, as the public health conditions improved and more New Yorkers got vaccinated, we made it a very careful decision to mark the week of August 2nd as the date for staff to return to their workplace. We announced this decision in May to give faculty and staff the time to plan transition back to on-site work and to determine the logistical details surrounding their return. To prepare for reoccupancy and consistent with the university's safety first approach with an employee all along, we again have guidelines that govern the full reopening for the entire CUNY system, including 25 campuses and the central office location. The guidelines embody the current CDC for higher education and, and office-based work as well as best practice recommendation from our regulatory sources. Because CUNY College is different size, location, types of campus, the number of students, faculty, and staff, individual campus use CUNY guidelines to customize elements of the reopening plans. To assure a safe resumption of continuation of campus operation and personal instructions and work. While the state has significantly relaxed COVID protocols, and we, we, of course, will support city and reopening efforts. CUNY is committed to continue to increase in-person activities at a gradual and, and strategic manner. That will assure the continual health and safety of our community. Each campus plan will continue to be accessible to stakeholders online, campus, and CUNY best website. To foster meaningful community participation and reopening efforts, the campus have been advised that their stakeholder groups such as labor union must again be engaged. In each campus, we will work labor, work with labor unions to conduct safe work for through our facilities and, and we'll open and we'll, and we'll make sure that they, they see all the areas that we're, we're gonna be open. 
In fact, in the spirit of transparency and partnership, two weeks ago, I convened a meeting where representatives from all labor unions were invited to ask questions and express concerns about reopening. The meeting covered a wide range of topics such as on-site occupancy level, flexible work schedule guidelines, ventilation, HVAC work, health screening, and COVID testing. From a facility perspective, we have also been working diligently to prepare a higher rate of occupancy across the university. Ventilation was and continues to be a key component of our efforts. We have engaged an independent third party to conduct review of ventilation in CUNY buildings. Our goal in working with, cons with the consultants to ensure that CUNY buildings meet the CDC building ventilation guidelines, guidelines and recommendations. To meet these goals, our approach includes data collection from campus about their facilities, ventilation of data through, through interviews, verification data through interviews, excuse me, on-site visit and inspected buildings and performance, uh, and taking approach needed remedial actions such as upgrades or repairs of facilities that are essential to the start of the fall semester. Another core principle of reopening efforts has been supporting and encouraging our CUNY community to, to get vaccinated. CUNY has been at the forefront of state and city vaccination efforts. With five community, CUNY campus serving as vaccination sites, these five sites vaccinated nearly a million New Yorkers to continue doing our part. Each of our campus plans for fall also include communication strategies for increasing vaccination among students, faculty, and staff. As we get closer to fall reopening, we have carefully consulted our key stakeholders regarding vaccination and testing protocols for our campus and office. In this area, in all facets of reopening plans safely paramount in our approach. We expect everyone at CUNY campus or working in CUNY office will be vaccinated subject to mandatory testing protocols. More, more details testimony regarding this protocol will be offered by my colleague, Daniel Lemons, an interim and second vice chancellor of university programs. Our reopening efforts for the upcoming academic year will be greatly assisted by federal stimulus funding allocated to our campus. In June 7, the Board of Trustees Fiscal Committee approved fiscal year 2022 budget proposal, including federal stimulus funding from coronavirus response and relief supplement approach, American Rescue Plan Act. Our budget plan will now be considered by the full board in the meeting on June 28th. For our community cards, there's about $244 million available for federal stimulus fund for institute needs. For the upcoming fiscal year, our plans to utilize these resources in the following needs, 47.5 million for student support and retention, 5.7 million for reopening pause, 105.8 million to cover project revenue loss, 1.9 million for mental health services for our students, 3 million for online programs development, and 1.7 million for faculty professional development. For the remaining 77 million, college will be asked to include stimulus spending plans as part of the multi-year plan and submission for the use of for the use over the next two fiscal years. There are two items in our federal stimulus spending plan that I would like to, to know. First, setting aside, aside funding for reopening calls will help ensure the safe return to our campus as our colleges will be able to utilize these dollars for air quality testing, COVID-19 testing planning, testing and cleaning protocols for the purchase of PPE and facility enhancements. The second component of our stimulus funding plan I would like to, to know for the committee is the allocation of lost revenues. As those funds are currently being targeted to budget reductions, revenue loss resulting from four, that the city council will adopt a fiscal 22 budget that will provide some relief to CUNY targeted reductions so we can better use the stimulus dollars to redirect and reinvest in our students. I want to close my testament today by emphasizing that our primary objective is to ensure that our system, while reopening continues to be prioritized to the health and safety of all students, faculty, and staff. We are very thankful for the, for the entire higher education community, especially at the chair, Chair Barron, the City and University of New York, and our student 
through this very challenging year. I hope you join me today in looking at the year behind us with much pride for a collective resiliency in the year ahead with much anticipation and hope that our students and our staff and our faculty and everyone connected to the university will return safely. I would now like to turn it over to interim executive vice chancellor, university provost, Dan Lemons. Thank you for your testimony, university provost, Dr. Lemons. You may begin your testimony. Good morning, Jefferson Barron and members of the mm -hmm. Higher Education Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on important issues of CUNY's transformation into a post-pandemic university. My name is Daniel Lemons and I have the privilege of serving as Interim Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York. In what we hope are the waning days of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has reshaped New York and the nation, and the world, we as a society find ourselves in a place where once again, we can be proactive and not merely reactive to the forces around us. Indeed, CUNY has emerged from the pandemic as a modern university that's well positioned, not only to weather the challenges ahead, but prepared to explore, take advantage of the novel opportunities in front of us. In many ways, the pandemic was not a deterrent to CUNY's mission as nationally renowned as it is as an institution of higher education. Instead, the COVID-19 crisis proved itself an accelerant to the university's mission to create a holistic, equitable, digitized university fit for the 21st century and the demands of students in the New York community. I was asked by the committee to address how higher education has been changed through the effects of the pandemic. As a university system comprised of 25 schools and nearly 600,000 students, many of whom come from the populations that were and still are the most affected by the pandemic, economically and personally, CUNY learned valuable lessons throughout the crisis that will continue to inform the university's transformation into an effective and post-pandemic university that could serve as a national model. First and foremost, among these lessons, is that student expectation post-pandemic has changed regarding course delivery options and overall flexibility and learning modalities. Simply put, our students are now much more tech savvy and accustomed to a digital learning environment. In the past, an emphasis on digital learning had the trappings of an environment that was atomized and emotionally disengaged. However, due to the significant advancements in technology, and a comprehensive shift in culture. Digital learning has not only become more accessible for our students, it has become far more favorable for them. In fact, CUNY's most recent internal data revealed that the vast majority of our current student population now prefers digital learning environments to traditional in-person learning. At Lehman College, where I'm still interim president until the end of this month, almost 25% of our classes were taught in hybrid and online format before the pandemic. That percentage will likely be higher post-pandemic. The staggering shift in learning environment preference is one that absolutely can't be ignored by a post-pandemic university and must inform the university's response in retooling their courses and services for a post-pandemic world. For in this era of recovery, a responsive university will be a competitive university. It must also be noted that although CUNY students have been overwhelmingly perseverant and resilient during the pandemic, they have experienced a significant loss of learning, as have most students at all levels nationwide. And so it's imperative that CUNY redouble its already expansive digital learning efforts in order to provide students with the tools to regain their academic momentum in the coming semesters. The disruption of the plant pandemic and the rapid shift to remote learning also changed the faculty of the university. Although, as I mentioned, some colleges such as Lehman had already many hybrid and online sections, now all instructors are experienced in the use of digital resources. And even if they are teaching in-person classes, those resources are key to improving the quality of the education we offer 
and increasing its accessibility to a wider range of students. This in mind, I'm happy to stand here today before the committee and present several examples of how CUNY has adapted its courses and services while adhering to its historic charge, scope, and mission. Very confident that the initiatives I summarize here today will paint a picture of a compassionate and a forward-thinking university that ensures university, that ensures safety, health, equity, and especially academic momentum. In April, 2020, CUNY made a quick pivot to digital learning, eventually converting an estimated 95% of its 1400 academic courses to fully online. This massive system-wide conversion effort is a testament to CUNY's nimbleness as an institution that values academic momentum and its responsiveness in the face of an historic crisis. Aside from the university's swift conversion to digital learning, CUNY remained committed to re retaining a sense of community among its more than 600,000 students, ensuring that their learning experience, although graphic geographically distanced from each other, would not feel disjointed or atomized. So CUNY ensured that student, faculty, and staff experiences were enhanced by the work of Cisco Incorporated to establish access for over 300,000 users, and subsequently by working to acquire an enterprise-wide license of Zoom's video conferencing solution. Now includes its new live transcription service to aid CUNY users who require assistive technology. During COVID-19 crisis, CUNY rose to the challenge as a 21st century institution of higher education that understands that for its diverse student body, academic momentum means more than providing courses, it also entails affording students the resources they require to focus on their studies. As you know, the vast majority of CUNY students come from African-American, Latino, and immigrant communities very same communities that bore the brunt of the pandemic in New York City. The pandemic exacerbated longstanding inequities endured by these communities and CUNY students in particular. For instance, many CUNY students work either full or part-time in the service sector, which experienced an industry-wide layoff in the spring of 2020. Such immediate and unexpected loss of income was devastating for our students many of whom are supporting a family while earning their degree. A survey last year revealed that over 40% had lost their jobs during the pandemic. In response, CUNY worked assiduously to secure and equitably distribute close to $118 million to 198,000 of our students through emergency relief funds through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Package CARES. It was just distributed, it was just distributed another 118 million through CRISA, the federal act, and in the coming fall term, we'll distribute additional federal funds to the majority of CUNY students. In addition, the university raised more than $10 million in distributed emergency grants to over 12,000 students through the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund. That's in addition to groundbreaking fundraising by individual campuses in support of food pantries, emergency loans, and scholarships. As part of CUNY's holistic mission to serve our students, many of whom are raising children while pursuing a degree, all 17 of the university's campus child care centers will be open in the fall of 2021, and all will be capable of serving 100% of their licensed capacity. Children of CUNY's student parents will be enrolled regardless of whether their parents are opting for in-person, hybrid or remote classes. Work is also underway to address any challenges with regards to physical space centers occupy, including ventilation, cleaning, and minor repairs. Meanwhile, CUNY childcare programs are recruiting and enrolling children now for the fall semester. Some programs will begin offering their services this summer. In an effort to streamline communication, the Central Office of Early Childhood Initiatives has established a phone line and email address for student parents to use to further them as they seek childcare for their children. The University Dean for Early Childhood Initiatives and her team meet with the center directors monthly and individually when necessary 
to support the reopening process. For programs that may need to hire new staff following the pandemic, the Office of Early Childhood Initiatives offers its employee network to enable center directors to find staff who meet the New York City licensing requirements. In addition to supporting centers through their site recoveries, they became eligible to apply to participate in Quality Stars New York, New York's quality rating and improvement system, which provides on-site consultation and coaching professional develop and a wide development and a wide variety of resources, including equipment and materials. Additional work continues to add in classrooms to at least three centers in the coming year, with the target date of January 2022 for opening those new classrooms. Pandemic also exacerbated the digital divide that existed among our student population. The conversion of courses to digital learning meant that in order to maintain academic momentum, students would need the technology to connect with their classes. And so as a further example of its role as a responsive university, CUNY and its campuses launched an enormous effort to equip students, many of whom live in internet deserts and do not have laptop computers of their own. It quickly acquired and equitably distributed more than 33,000 laptops and tablets to students, as well as 4,000 mobile broadband hotspots. That all to support their learning needs as part of the university's pivot to digital learning. These devices are still available for student use and are under the responsibility and management of the colleges to determine their availability and to distribute the devices directly. These devices are intended to be loaner devices and are expected to be returned to the colleges when the student use ends. Along with the distribution of aid and technology and system-wide conversion, digital learning, CUNY understood that a 21st century university, pandemic or not, must provide streamlined administrative processes that enhance the student, faculty, and staff experience. Key example of this is Lehman College's successful effort to convert 20 vital administrative processes that had been performed manually to fully automated and online. First among these were the automation of declaration of major forms. Lehman, like many other colleges, requires students to declare a major before they have earned 60 credits. Historically, this process would be performed through a physical paper form that needs to be signed by a student, their advisor, and then the registrar, which can take a lengthy amount of time to complete. However, Lehman's automated process allows for the forms to be completed and signed electronically, thereby significantly cutting the time the process takes and enhancing student satisfaction. Second example of Lehman's work on this front is its conversion of the credit transfer evaluation process to fully online. Currently, well over 60% of Lehman students are students who have transferred from other colleges, including CUNY, and non-CUNY community colleges. The smooth and seamless transfer of their previously earned credits is integral to maintaining their academic momentum and their ability to retain financial aid. Again, this process has been performed manually with students, the admissions office, and faculty exchanging and signing physical forms. This time-consuming process, along with CUNY's social distancing measures, precluded in-person meetings and Lehman's conversion to an online process is not only necessary, it's also overdue. And so the process is now fully digitized and ensures both transparency and expediency where transfer credit evaluations are now completed in days, not weeks. And I would note that this new tool is being used by other CUNY colleges uh, uh, following Lehman's example. The digitization of these key processes at Lehman have proven successful and uh, they are continuing and being expanded. The COVID-19 pandemic also reinforced CUNY's mission as an institution of higher education that's dedicated to innovative approaches to our student career pathways. In short, CUNY has been and will continue to be a university that focuses on career building education and one that affords our students a pathway to a meaningful life-sustaining work and greater agency over their lives. Key example of CUNY's work on this front during the pandemic is its shifted focus to improve career pathways via the new CUNY Upskilling Initiative. 
Through the initiative, thousands of students enroll in free courses to gain marketable skills sought after and in the new post-COVID-19 economy. In the last nine months, more than 74,000 visitors accessed the initiative. In addition to CUNY's focus on digitized courses and services for its students, the university has redoubled its effort to train its tens of thousands of faculty in digital learning environments. Even before the pandemic, CUNY was proactive on this front. Pre-pandemic, CUNY founded its Innovative Teaching Academy, a hub for professional development that we believe will become a national model. As part of this effort, roughly 450 faculty have participated in one of the Association of College and University Educators, ACCU, micro-credential programs. Another 300 faculty are participating in ACCU's full 25-week course. During the pandemic, CUNY also developed and launched its award-winning School of Professional Studies online teaching essentials workshop. As of spring 2021, the program has been completed by 2,000 faculty who since doing so have taught more than 11,000 classes with a combined enrollment of more than 268,000 students. Furthermore, as part of the Innovative Teaching Academy, a unique partnership with Western, with Western Governors University has led to the development of faculty training programs that nearly 250 faculty successfully completed. Additionally, more than 250 faculty completed a workshop on open pedagogy and mindset, and another 200 faculty participated in a workshop on learning mindsets. Finally, along with Dean Ayman El Mohandes, CUNY's Graduate School of Public Health and Policy, I have had the privilege of co-chairing a task force to make recommendation regarding CUNY's official vaccination policy. This task force included voices from CUNY faculty, students, and administration, as well as leaders from the public health sphere. I must be clear that until CUNY's Board of Trustees approves the vaccination policy, I'm unable to provide you with the finalized policy. However, I can reiterate some things regarding the policy that we know for certain. Governor Cuomo has mandated that CUNY and the State University of New York SUNY students be vaccinated. The mandate is contingent upon FDA approval of at least one of the vaccines now being given emergency authorization. Pfizer applied in May for full licensure. At CUNY and SUNY, the mandates will be activated only when that contingency occurs and after their respective boards approve a specific policy about how the mandate would be carried out. Regardless of the activation of the vaccination mandate by the FDA approval, there will be mandatory testing on every CUNY campus starting in the fall. All unvaccinated students, faculty, and staff will be required to participate in testing according to a protocol that will be announced by CUNY in the coming weeks. Individuals may opt out of the testing if they share information that shows they are vaccinated. In any case, we're strongly urging that everyone be vaccinated as soon as possible, as it's still the safest course to preventing the spread of COVID-19. Once CUNY's Board of Trustees approves the proposed vaccination policy and the university deploys a swift and streamlined communication effort around it, university representatives will be able to speak much more specifically and on the record about the policy. I firmly believe that CUNY's advancement on digitized learning services, faculty training, and its redoubled commitment to career pathways signal a university that is very well positioned to take on the challenges and to take advantage of the opportunities that the post-pandemic world will offer. We're taking action to ensure that our faculty staff and students are vaccinated or test negative if they're on our CUNY campuses or in a CUNY office. We'll always be a university that values in-person instruction, advising, and services. But in order to provide students with the flexibility that they need to access courses of study and earn degrees in the midst of busy, complicated lives, the growing digital learning environment is essential. I'm confident that CUNY, as the nation's largest and most reliable engine of economic mobility, will continue to serve as a national model for what a 21st century institution of higher learning could and should be. For this and so many other reasons, 
I stand here today optimistic about what lies ahead. Thank you for your testimony. Vice Chancellor, Dr. Maybank, you may begin. Good morning. And I thank you, Chairperson Inez Barron, for this opportunity, along with the members of the higher, to present to you and the members of the Higher Education Committee regarding the what it is that we will be doing as we return to CUNY campuses in the wake of the COVID-19 experience. My name is Denise Maybank and I'm honored to serve as the Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at the City University of New York. I had the privilege of coming before you on prior occasions and I return to focus on what we are planning to do to support the success of the amazing CUNY students as we return for greater in-person experiences and continue to assure that CUNY students thrive through this next phase of transition. As we prepare to return for in-person instruction and engagement in, in the fall, there are many strategies, programs, initiatives, and activities being implemented to assure students thrive. To this end, we want students to select CUNY as their destination for advancing their learning. We have implemented promising programs and practices, and we plan to keep students engaged. In support of enrollment, I first highlight two financial aid-related initiatives. Students who file the FAFSA may qualify for an adjustment in their federal financial aid. If there have been significant changes or circumstances that are impacting their ability to pay for college, they may submit a, prof a professional judgment appeal to the financial aid office. Over 14,000 students were notified of this option on June 9th, and immediately nearly 300 students responded. Secondly, the benefits of the American Rescue Plan Act include financial resources that will go directly to eligible students enrolled in CUNY during the 2021 to 22 academic year. Messaging drawing attention to the opportunity may help those otherwise concerned about the cost of attendance to make a quality decision to enroll now. In spring 2021, more than half of CUNY degree-seeking enrolled students received a grant on average between $600 and $1,000 from the previous round of stimulus funds. So more to come. Being attentive to the decline in the enrollment of Black and Latinx men, the programs of CUNY's Black Male Initiative, BMI, are designed to provide additional layers of academic and social support for students from populations that are severely underrepresented in higher education, particularly African, African-American, Black, Caribbean, Latino, and Hispanic males. With initiatives such as high interest dialogues, collaboration with community-based organizations, and culturally competent peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. BMI is highly effective in attracting students of color and engaging them for ultimate academic success. With the recent expansion of Mentors Matter funding, being, BMI will be able to increase its peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. The University Admissions Office is partnering with ASAP to improve enrollment and retention of disconnected youth in New York through the CUNY Welcome Back campaign. This campaign focuses on the reclamation of two particular student populations for fall 2021. Those who, were, who had participated in an ASAP previously and are not currently enrolled, and those who were admitted for fall 20 and spring 21, but who did not actually enroll at any college. As part of this campaign, students are invited to connect with a dedicated counselor to receive support for their re-enrollment. During the pandemic, we formed new ways of responding to student needs that matter and have made a difference and that need to continue. Mental health counseling continues to offer online mental health services via teletherapy to students both on and off campus and we are planning to transition to in-person counseling this fall. 
I want to assure you that the $5 million investment in mental health services from the CARES Act funds has made a difference for students. The crisis text line has had 500 conversations completed since its launch in February. The main issues identified have been the ac academics and school, anxiety and stress, and depression. There has been an 87% satisfaction rate with this service. The 10 minute mind, which offers relaxation and meditation options, has over 27,000 registered users. Most use the product three to seven times weekly. And Talkspace, the teletherapy option for our out of state and international students, currently has 4,000. 734 registered users. Health services units are preparing for a return to in-person or hybrid services. Clinical and wellness services will become available and online health events will be provided throughout the academic year to provide virtual resources and expand wellness education beyond the traditional in-person experience. Health services will also continue to manage immunization requirements, both existing and new. Virtual service counters are an invention from the pandemic. For the offices of financial aid and the bursar, there were, these virtual service counters were established as in-person service, as in-person service was curtailed. The model of meeting students' needs through virtual advising and problem solving has proven to be a model to keep. Students have responded to the more relaxed interactions facilitated through this space and advisors have expressed yeah. feeling more productive. We want to keep students engaged. That is, that is something we are determined to do. Students are being kept informed about return in-person expectations and protocols through campus websites and outreach efforts, employing emails, text messages, and in some instances, phone calls. Services and activities for students associated with turning include childcare, as you heard, we have 17 childcare centers and the capacity to accommodate 1,800 students. Students in the residence halls are provided with a copy of COVID protocols and guidelines for living in the halls. The residence hall directors work closely with the students to ensure that these protocols and procedures are followed. For this next initiative, I begin by saying thank you. Thank you to the council for supporting the partnership between the Summer Youth Employment Program and CUNY to launch the CUNY Recovery Corps. This initiative will provide paid work opportunities for 5,000 CUNY students this summer. They will join in the efforts of meeting the challenges faced by various entities during the COVID-19 pandemic. This initiative has attracted the interest of 6,400 students who submitted applications and are being considered for placement. Of particular note, several hundred of the participating student interns will be dedicated to the CUNY Welcome Corps, a special program utilizing the power of peer leadership and aimed at directly addressing the needs of students transitioning to CUNY this summer. With that, I wanna talk just a moment about the orientation program, which has continued throughout the pandemic and into the new modalities of learning we will experience in the fall. The campuses remain committed to offering exciting programs to welcome new students and prepare them for their collegiate experience. Since transitioning to an online platform, some campuses have reported increased participation in orientation. For example, at Bronx Community College, 28% of students completed orientation in fall 2019, while 51% of students completed orientation in fall 2020. Additionally, Bronx Community College has collected data that demonstrates students who complete the online orientation program gain significantly higher GPAs by the midterm and by the end of the semester compared to their peers who did not complete the program. 
Campuses have also added content to their orientation programming to enhance students' preparation for college and for joining the diverse CUNY community. Some campuses have included a racial and social justice component in response to all we all are experiencing. For example, John Jay College has included a session in which the values, diversity, and identity of the college are discussed. Many campuses recognize that virtual and remote learning can be an isolating experience and that students can become disengaged during the gaps between acceptance, registration, and formal orientation. At Gutman Community College, incoming students have the opportunity to join live weekly sessions throughout the summer to engage with the campus community. And the College of Staten Island incoming students are assigned a peer mentor with whom they can connect throughout the summer until they begin coursework in the fall. In the fall. And K Kingsborough Community College, a monthly FAQ session is held to answer questions and address concerns from the incoming class. CUNY's College Discovery and Seek Opportunity programs will provide four four to five week virtual developmental summer experience for incoming first year students. The program will provide participants with exposure to campus resources and preparation for a successful transition to college. Among the mechanisms for meeting the essential needs of our students, and that's something that often is referred to as basic needs, but there's nothing basic about them, they are essential. We are using our campus resource centers, and those centers provide students with in-person financial and legal counseling, public health benefit screening, healthcare enrollment, and free tax preparation. The resource centers also have taken up responsibility for providing emergency funds um, ho and holding the responsibility for the food pantries, housing referrals, services targeting student parents, clothing assistance, case management referrals, and outreach services. In response to CUNY's fall reopening, some of our resource centers have added other initiatives to enhance support to students. The Access Resource Center program at Kingsborough is increasing the value of their supermarket gift cards and the Gutman Connect Center will implement a fresh direct program where they can send groceries directly to students' homes. Associated with food insecurity is the fact that policy changes have dramatically increased the number of students, of CUNY students, eligible to apply for SNAP benefits. To facilitate applications, CUNY has, is providing easily downloadable enrollment verification forms. More than 200,000 presumptively eligible students were in, notified of the changes through email. And the CUNY SNAP web, website has been updated to include this new information. CUNY is working with Swipe Out Hunger's CUNY food navigators and HRA to provide support to the thousands of community students who may be eligible now for SNAP as a result of the legislative changes. Over 17,000 CUNY enrollment verification forms have been downloaded to date. Housing instability still remains a concern and the resource centers are available to support students facing those circumstances. In terms of student inclusion initiatives, the CUNY Office of Disability Programs has focused on training and development that helps build the readiness of colleges to accommodate and support students with disabilities in the remote learning environment. Our LGBTQI plus hub and advocacy academy were launched this spring, enhancing services to and engagement of members of the LGBTQI plus community at CUNY. The Central Office of Veterans Affairs established a tutor coordination project designed to connect student veterans with existing college tutorial resources available during remote learning. The pandemic, has been labeled as unprecedented and certainly has been. But we want to assure you that we have and will continue to devise unprecedented responses in support of the extraordinary students who make CUNY a part of their destiny. 
Thank you, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee for your interest and attention to the return to CUNY campuses in the wake of COVID-19. I trust we have provided information responsive to your inquiry and useful in your deliberations. We stand committed to assuring CUNY is the place of thriving for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maybank, for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raised hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. I'll now turn it to the chair for, to begin her questions. Uh, thank you for the panel. To the, thank you to the panel for coming and presenting your testimony. And good to see you all again. You've been before this body before, and we're glad to see you. I do want to acknowledge that we were also joined by council members Rosenthal and Combo, and I'm sure that we'll be able to offer them an opportunity to present their questions. I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to move quickly. When will CUNY campuses reopen? I think I heard you say in August, staff was notified that they were to return. So what is the actual date of return? Well, for- um, One common date or will each campus determine their own opening date? Yeah, um, so for the central office, uh, the, the date is August 2nd, the week of August 2nd. Uh, System-wide, we're, you know, we're asking uh, the system to be ready by August 2nd. Um, each campus, I think our official date, I'll let our provost sort of jump in here. Each campus has, um, our official date is August 24th, but some campus start a little later than that. Um, but um, that's when faculty is, is sort of due back. Uh, Dan, did I, uh, did I miss anything? No, I, um, <clears throat> yes, I, even though this, it's the central office that uh, has August 2 as our reopening, uh, the campuses also have, I think, are really mostly working towards that date too in terms of reopening offices. And, and because throughout August is really a ramp up to the fall term. And by the middle of August, there will be a lot of activity on campus. Faculty will be there, uh, offices will be open, and, and students also will be visiting campus in preparation to the fall term. What is the start date for courses to begin? August 25th. Okay. And will each campus have the same outline or the same requirements or what are the pro protocols and the order in which these needed to be ident identified as having been met in any document? Oh, there, are, there, are, there are system wide guidelines. Yes. Um, each campus, because we have vertical campus, we have horizontal campus. We, each campus will be different depending on, on how the campus um, prepares to assure that we meet the guidelines connected to social distance and, and those requirements. Uh, we, as I stated in my testimony, we have we've always, we've been approved already to be at, the campus have been approved already to be at 25%. Yes. So we're starting from a 25% baseline. And so some campus, so just, I'm just gonna make this up. This is not a fact, right? Hunter could be at 35%. Lehman, which is a much different campus, right? Could be at 40, 40%, right? Each campus will be di uh, di uh, different, but each campus will have a set of guidelines that they have to uh, adhere to, to assure that uh, they're meeting uh, the requirements that set forth by the state, the CDC, the city, and, and, and sort of best practices. Is there a deadline date by which each of those guidelines must be uh, met? So the deadline for, for the campuses to submit plans was June 15th. Right. My office, uh, my office is now in the process of reviewing those plans um, and, and going back and forth with campuses on areas where we feel there are deficiencies. Okay. The, the, the challenging part of all of this is that every single day, it changes, right? So when we set the set of guidelines to put forth to the campuses, um, they will operate on one set of guidelines. Then the governor 
The mm -hmm. CDC came out with new guidelines, so now we have to reship. So I'm in the process of sending the campuses some new guidelines, some new requirements, so they can make the, the proper uh, adjustments. So at the end of the day, once I sign off on it, the chancellor, then I get to sit down with the chancellor, and he he uh, reviews each individual campus to make sure that they meet the mandates that we were required. I understand that it has to be submitted to the Board of Trustees as well, and that's happening at the end of the month. Will there be a public report, perhaps by the end of August, detailing how, the, how CUNY's opening goals were achieved and the areas for improvement? Yeah, I, 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 let me just correct it. The, the plans are not submitted to the Board of Trustees. The guidelines were, we, we discussed the guidelines with the Board of Trustees, but the plans are not submitted to the Board of Trustees. So um, what is it that has to be submitted to the Board of Trustees at the meeting, uh, I think next the budget, month? The budget. The budget, but not the plans for reopening in terms of the policies. Well, there, there, there's going to be some, some policies like, you know, vaccination and some of these other policies that the board has to approve, of course. But, you know, the, the specifics of the guidelines and plans, no. Okay. Um, and what services and facilities will CUNY prioritize during the first stage of reopening in the fall? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following you. I mean, I think that, let, let me see if I answer your question. Uh, let me try, give it a shot. So I think what we're, we're, if a campus is going to be a 25% occupancy, right? They have to bring back all the services that they need to support a 25% occupancy, whether it's pantries, uh, libraries, whatever services they need. And that's factor in with the 25%. Did that answer your question, Councilman? Yes. Right, so it'll be it'll match what it is that the percentages of return required to have happening. Gotcha. The governor has said that all students must be vaccinated in SUNY and CUNY. Has there been any similar statement regarding faculty, staff at CUNY? Any such? Uh, we we are highly encouraging us. I probably stated. Uh, because he's, he's chairing a, a committee, a task force that the, the chancellor has put forth with the head of public health. Um, we're encouraging our staff and faculty to get vaccinated. If they're not vaccinated, um, they will be tested before, um, before going being allowed to into any of our facilities. Can you describe the uh, county now, the CUNY has received federal funds to upgrade its ventilation systems. And we know that's a critical component to fighting this disease that we're in. So what are the plans to allocate that fund, those funds? I know that in previous hearings that we've had, there were oftentimes complaints about the poor ventilation, about mold in CUNY buildings, about peeling paint and all of that. So how did you target or how are you targeting those schools that have the greatest need? And I did hear you mention about the HVAC system, but what particularly are we trying to ensure are the standards that we have met to protect all of those persons at CUNY? So uh, Councilwoman, like always, you always are very challenging with your questions. There's a lot of questions there, so I'm gonna try to hopefully, and if I don't answer them, please uh, tell me, uh, so let, let me take a couple of them, at a, 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 break them up a couple of them at a time. So the way the way we, the chancellor, uh, ventilation is obviously at the forefront of everyone's mind and concern, right? So what we decided to do is bring in a, a third party to really look at um, our, our buildings, 300 plus buildings, right? We then um, met with all the colleges and said, um, of the of the buildings in your particular campus, which are the ones that are essential for you to be able to open, right? So they gave us a list. Okay. And, and of those buildings that are essential, which ones are have new systems, which ones you have concerns about, right? So we broke those, those up into different tiers, right? Then um, we then put them through this company that we, we brought on board, put them through the CDC guidelines in terms of ventilation to make sure that they met those sort of guidelines. Then we then uh, took uh, 
those buildings and then went out and did field visits to, to, to inspect the, the, uh, the ventilations and to ensure that, number one, um, as per the chancellor's mandate, we have put in new, uh, new filters, right? Now, I know there's a lot of talk about HEPA filters. Well, in some cases, some facilities, if you put in a HEPA filter, it actually does, it works against it because it doesn't allow for more clean air to come in. Not every system um, requires a HEPA 13 filter and so forth because it creates a, um, so we went and evaluated to make sure that number one, that the filters were put in. Number two, to make sure that that building was oper operating like it was designed to operate. And we're not operating, it was put into a, another into a, um, another area so to be evaluated. And if, the, if we could not repair that, then we will go to tier number two. So the three tiers that were created was essential buildings, buildings that would be nice if they had and buildings they really don't need. So then we went into the next tier of buildings to sort of say that that particular camp as well, I don't think in time we're gonna be able to get that building, that facility ready. So you're gonna to have to use this facility in order to accommodate your classroom. So that's kind of the work that's going on there. At the end of all of this, each campus will have a report that will tell them how each of their buildings are operated that they're gonna be using. And that will be a report that will be shared with the unions as they're doing their walkthroughs to make sure that they're, uh, you know, that they're, our employees, our faculty and staff are feeling comfortable with the kind of work that, that we've done. And let me be clear, the chancellor has made it very clear to me and to our team that this is at the highest priority. So not only did we hire one consultant, we brought an additional consultant to do work uh, field work to make sure that we, we've got through all those, all, all those problems. So hopefully I answer your question. Yes, you did. And uh, in terms of establishing those tiers, what role did other stakeholders have in identifying those locations that needed to be uh, addressed or inspected? Was well, I, 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 president, you know, there were other stakeholders, the students, of course, themselves would know that there might be particular areas yeah, so when it comes to the buildings, um, I, I, won't, I won't take the buildings in isolation. I think that the way that the chancellor has, has instructed his, his presidents to do is to engage the community. And what's, who's in that community? The unions, the students, the stakeholders, and their opening plans. Within their opening plans are buildings and all the different components that are part of their opening plan. So there's been committees that have been formed, they've been engaged in those discussions. So it's to cover the whole plan, not just building specific plan. Within that, obviously, we don't know right now what buildings each college is gonna use until those plans get reviewed. Once those plans get reviewed and approved, then stakeholders, the union particularly, will be able to know that at I'm gonna use a dance college at Lehman, building A, B, D, E were approved to be open. Those are the buildings. And as you notice, C was not included. So C is not open. It's not a building we're gonna use. So those are the four buildings that you're, we're gonna put staff in there and, you're, and you should go there and do your inspections, you know, and, with in compliance. Uh, a question about the percentages that each of the schools will establish in terms of the students that will be involved in on-campus learning. Can you tell us how the percentages will impact the residential or housing needs of students? Are you talking about dorms? Yes. Okay. So when, when it comes to dorms, I mean, uh, as, as our probe was stated earlier, we're, we're once we're hoping that we're going to have a, a vaccination plan that that um, once these the FDA approves this um, uh, vaccination and and all all the dorm students will be will be asked to to, to be vaccinated right and in order for them to occupy that 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 particular location right. Um, uh, when it comes to dorms and so forth. So the reality is that our goal is hopefully to be able to have fully vaccinated students 
occupying a and using uh, the dorms uh, to its capacity. Are there shared rooms in the dorms or are the rooms in dorms individual or does it vary? Are there suites where there are three students sharing an apartment type? They, they vary. The quads, the, the singles, the doubles, depending on, 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 on every, every particular campus. Now, with, you know, dorm for us is not a big number. I think we have total system-wise 1,700 or so. Um, Denise could correct me if I am wrong on that, um, but I think we don't. I mean, we don't have a lot of a lot of dorm uh, students. You know, we're commuter uh, commuter schools, but so it's mostly our dorms are located at Queens College, um, CSI, City College, and then we have some lease uh, uh, Hunter Baruch. We have some lease John Jay. We have some lease areas, but for the most part, um, we're not a big dorm. Um, Right. But for those who are not locals or whose home situation uh, don't allow for them to live at home and they're in dorms, that's a critical issue. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering what would be the percentage that you think might be impacted if you have a, a double and you've decided, well, it's a room that's supposed to be double, but we're only going to allow one student. Have you made any projections as to the reduction in student numbers that would be able to utilize the housing that CUNY does offer? I, I'm not sure who, what students you're referring to. I mean, I think that um, we have a program with, uh, with ACS, right? Uh, if you're referring to those students, you know, obviously we will make whatever accommodations we need to make to ensure that um, students are, are I think safe. you said there were 1,700 students or thereabouts that use the dorm facilities at CUNY? What is your projection as to what that number will be now if we have to reduce the uh, use of? I, I have to get back to you. I can't, you know, really can't answer that right now. Okay. I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by oh, Council Member Ulrich. I don't know if he left. He did have a question, but uh, we have been joined by Council Member Ulrich. And if he returns, I will defer to have him ask his question. Sure. Chair Barron, one thing I could maybe add to that consideration. It's been said before, we know that the, the ground keeps shifting under our feet. Sure. But if we, if we do end up with a mandatory vaccination policy, that's very likely to impact what will be possible in the dorms, as well as in other situation on campus. So what are we going to do or what mechanism has been put in place to allow for notice to be given to the campus responsible for making sure that things are correct. If I'm a student and I see a condition that I think is inadequate or suspicious or hazardous, what mechanism is in place for me to immediately report that and get a response? Well, each campus um, has um, uh, their, their, their own website, uh, their own email, where um, students or anyone can report any, any, any uh, challenges connected or any, so for anything example, that they've seen. For example, in this age of COVID, if I go to the bathroom and I notice, oh my gosh, there's no soap. It's really an important issue now. We're talking about thorough hand washing. How do I report that, whatever the system is that's in place for that? And how quickly does it get responded to? Um, you know, according to, uh, as our plan has been laid out, you know, they should be responded very quickly. I mean, each campus has their own mechanism. How things get reported. Uh, happy to share that with you. Um, I, I can address each campus, how they handle it, but I know every campus has their own sort of system in order to be addressed. I will say this, that a couple of things are, are connected to inspections. Number one, um, we have not only- I'm not just in, talking about the inspections, because I understand that- um, No, no, but I, it's connected to your question, right? Okay. Um, each, each, we have, we have an executive director for, for environmental safety and, and uh, centrally, each campus has their own. The idea is that uh, our, our director, Financial Safety has been working with the local campus to really put together uh, a protocol in terms of looking at uh, facilities and making sure that 
that, that things are um, including the bathrooms, that the bathrooms uh, are, are, are being looked at. We also have implemented um, more cleaning. So instead of, you know, which by itself, every time, you know, three times a day, multiple times a day going and cleaning okay. by itself, those that would allow for if we have no soap for those soap dispensers to be filled and things along those lines. So we put in different mechanisms in place and I'm happy to send that to you in, in, in writing. Thank you. How will CUNY engage engage students? Were you were you still speaking? Had no, you finished? I finished. Okay. How will CUNY engage students to interact with COVID safety plans updates? Uh, as you've said, it's constantly changing. So how are we going to engage students? Uh, is there anything similar to the hashtag VaxUp CUNY campaign? And how will students be made of any be made aware of the liaison or the point person at any particular school? You know, we, we have done a really, uh, I believe, a, a, a marketing and communication and parking system. Why has done really, Fred, really done an amazing job of making sure that not only our campuses, our students, uh, I would tell you that we, we use close to, we, we reach close to 3 million users. Um, this past uh, several months connected to, you know, communication uh, connected to COVID-19. Uh, each campus has been asked to, to have, you know, uh, communications connected to that. Uh, I will let um, uh, either the uh, Provost Lemons or uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Maybach, uh, you know, add more to it. But um, I think we're, we're very proud of the work that has been done by our communication department in conjunction with our colleges and, and getting the information out uh, to our students. But uh, if, if any of you want to add anything to that that I missed. Sure, I, I'd be happy to add, Hector. Um, I mean, one, I can I can answer partly, put on my Lehman College president hat to respond okay. to that, having been really close to the ground on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but, you know, first, just from the central point of view, the central communication has been really extensive. And I think it's really touched all the media. We know that, you know, we can send emails, put things on websites, but students right. tend to access other ways, right? They use Instagram, they use Facebook, mm -hmm. they use other methods to get information. And we've worked really hard to be on social media and have a really active pres presence. And, you know, I know, for instance, at Lehman College, um, I, I did lots and lots of live briefings and that was for faculty, staff, and students. But but I also did Instagram live briefings very regularly for students because I knew that was where they were very likely to mm -hmm. tune in and get information. And and I think that's pretty true of the other campuses too. That there's been a lot of outreach that way because uh, it's 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 things have changed so quickly, and there's never enough information. And but as soon as we had it. We try to get it out to students and let them know. May I add that um, Senior Vice Chancellor Glenda Grace convenes the COVID liaisons on a regular basis, and it's a very robust group, and they share information amongst themselves. They come up with ways of communicating to the campus community, <clears throat> and that, and those, that list of people is available. But maybe we can do, you know, we can certainly push that information out on social media as well so that students know exactly who the person is for their campus. But they're pretty much known. They're pretty active. They're pretty engaging. And they're paying attention regularly to what is going on and making certain that we're responding appropriately. Thank you very much. Um, comparing CUNY's course offerings for the fall of 2019, pre pandemic pre-pandemic, what percentage will be offered this fall in 2021? And how many will be offered in person? Will there be an increase in the number of digital or hybrid learning as well? And was there a particular academic area where you said there was a significant decrease in the course offerings? Sure. Um, First of all, in terms of the fall 21 course offerings, we, we very much are in a transition back to being an in-person university. Right. And um, 
And also being a commuter school, it kind of makes us stand apart from a lot of big university systems we might compare us to because we heard lots of universities going fully in person. We are, we're in between there. We're gonna have about 50% in-person and hybrid courses and about 50% online courses. Uh, that percentage is pretty settled now. It's been evolving over the last month as we have, had, have settled the schedule, but that's gonna be pretty close to where we're going to land. We try to pay attention a lot to what it is that students are asking for and what they want. Um, and very interesting is because uh, actually a majority of students are still preferring distance learning to being in person. And, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, and again, I think that goes to our being a commuter school and other issues you know, that students face. But um, so we're, what we've tried to do is to make our course offerings help us through that transition because we know next spring, barring you know, any, any changes that, that are really in the wrong direction with the pandemic, by next spring, we expect to be fully back in person except for those programs you know, that we very intentionally want to be offered hybrid or online. So we're to the transition is what we're in. And, and that's, the, that's where we are right now. We're at 50%. So in terms of the, the courses, you know, compared from what I can do is I can compare fall 21 to fall 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and this overall across all of the campuses, there are 20% of courses that were offered fall 19 that are, will not be offered fall 21. Now I have to, there's a caveat there because when you talk about courses not offered, doesn't mean necessarily that it's 20% overall fewer courses because there are elective courses that will be offered one term and then another term they won't be offered. Some other course will be offered in place in a major. But overall, that's, that's the difference. And in terms of the areas, um, where there are the largest reductions in those, those courses offered in that comparison. Um, ethnic culture and gender studies, foreign languages, literatures, and, and linguistics, visual and performing arts, health professions, and related clinical sciences and business managing and marketing. Those are the top areas for that. Where there's been a decrease in the office. Where there's been a decrease, right. Interesting. Ethnic studies, I heard you say, has been a decrease. And that's, yeah. you would wonder, you would think, well, in this light of talking about social justice, that that yeah. would be an increase. Well, that's, that's interesting. Thank and you, you know what, um, the, if you think about what kind of, what drives that, I mean, of course, we, when we offer courses in response to demand. Right. And, and so, you know, if there's, a, if we're offering a course and there's a big demand, then we might open another section of that course, right? Whatever it is. So there's a lot of a lot of expansion, contraction in the offerings in response to enrollment. And so what I would say, my my guess is, and I don't know this because you know this would require a lot of you know surveying and finding out from specific students. My my guess is that the reason that we saw reductions in programs is that student demand really changed a lot through the pandemic. And, and so I, I fully expect that will rebound uh, by the spring when the, when the pressure of the pandemic uh, on students, particularly economic pressure, will, will hopefully be much less. Thank you. In terms of student degree tracks, either associate or baccalaureate, has the reduction in course options impaired students' progress over the past year and a half? And how is the university prepared to reorient and or offer additional course options to accelerate any setback or assist students with getting back on track? So um, surveys prior to COVID showed that a sizable minority of students couldn't access all the courses that they felt they needed to graduate. That was, some, that was a study that, we, that was pre-COVID. Uh, that that's what students were telling us. And there's a sizable minority of students said that. Um, and so what we've been doing um, in response to that, because that obviously is a significant concern for us. We want students to be able, if they need to complete a major, we wanna make sure that they have 
the courses available to do that. They're not sitting there for a term or a year waiting for some course that's required. So we, we have been doing a number of things. Some of these things have been underway for quite some time, uh, but there are a number of things that we've been doing, uh, and this is pre-COVID again, mostly, uh, to try to make sure that we're able to offer students the courses they need, because we're, we obviously, we want students to finish uh, in a timely way. Mm -hmm. So one of them is a curriculum and event management system that um, has already been very effective at helping us to manage the curriculum. It allows for real-time integration uh, across our CUNY information systems, something very important. Another one is University Student Schedule Builder. Uh, that's been fully implemented at all the community colleges now. It, it enables students to plan and register for courses that meet their degree requirements, schedules, and, the, and also their personal constraints. So it's a very important tool, help students to actually develop their schedule term by term in a way that's going to work for them. We've also had an academic momentum campaign that's now in about its third year, um, actually going, going into its fourth year. It's a comprehensive set of strategies that we're using to try to accelerate students towards their degrees. And, um, and if another very important tool, and it's one we've been using for some time, but it's been, it, it started out being fairly limited in its use. And what we're doing is we're expanding it so that the entire curriculum is covered. It's called degree maps. And so that allows a student to go onto uh, this degree map program and it will, it will lay out exactly for them. Here's the, here is the series of courses that you need to complete because that is not always easy to keep track of. Right. And you know there can, there can be requirements that you might miss, but this program uh, what departments do is they map out the degree. Here's what you need to do. And that is a very accurate accounting for students. So th these are things that we are doing to mm -hmm. try to make sure that students are getting the courses and that they know, right? They know what the courses are they need to finish. Right. Well, uh, that's so important because this past month, my son graduated <laughs> from Megger with his associates in liberal arts and his bachelor's in public administration. And it takes quite a bit of managing to make sure that you've got the right courses in the right places at the right time. So it's very, very important. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. He worked hard. He worked hard. I'm sure he uh, did. Move to the financial and student fees. How much have community colleges collected over the 2021 20, academic year in student fees? And have you pressed pause on collecting any of these student fees over the past year? And what do you do with those fees that are collected when the services can't or aren't rendered to students, such as the fee that they had for childcare that was a part that wasn't offered? And have you ever refunded those fees to students? So uh, on, the, on the fees, we collected about $21.5 million. Um, dollars. Um, but, um, for the for the uh, spring semester, we 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 refunded uh, students uh, fifty percent uh, of some of the of some of the fees uh, connected to um, the spring semester. Um, we also um, suspended uh, the activity fees because you know there was not a lot of activity going on in the campuses. So um, um, as you know, system wide. Uh, nationwide, CUNY is one of the lowest in the country in terms of our fees. Um, so we continue to make, you know, feel proud of, of, that, of that and continue to make sure that, you know, we, we're very mindful of those fees uh, sort of going forward. So um, is it still a suspension or of a designated amount do we have a finite number that we can say to students? Well, normally it would be X dollars, but this time it's X divided by two. That well, I'm happy to provide that to you, but uh, in the spring we, uh, we gave back about 50% uh, of the fee for student activities um, okay. for the spring 2020 uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic, uh, because we, we eliminated a lot of activities on campus. Uh, okay. How have the federal uh, 
Chair Pesson, yes. Karen, may I, yes, may I offer something? Um, I, I do want you to realize that a lot had been going on even in the midst of that. So yeah. the university student senate provided $110,000 in COVID emergency grants. Um, so that that information I think is really important as well. And the student government associations have been really active in making certain that there is programming available to students as well. So the, I, I just want you to be aware that that effort still is there in spite of what else may be going on around fees. The students are serious about making certain that everyone has attention given to their needs and to their interests as well. And, and we're so proud of the work that they do and their involvement and their voice. Thank you. They're amazing. Yes. How have the federal stimulus funds received by this by the institutions been designated to backfill tuition or revenue losses? And how do you plan to use remaining funds received to provide greater services? And will any of that money be used to uh, address faculty or staff layoffs? Well, uh, as you know, we, we're uh, our budget still has not been approved by the board. Right. As, as, as we, um, until we have approval from, from the board, um, we really cannot, you know, um, really state how these, how those funds are gonna get used uh, because the board well, ultimately are you has asking, to- Are you asking the board to consider using those funds to uh, address the faculty and staff needs? We're, we're asking the board to approve some of those funds to help us with some of the loss and revenues and enrollment uh, connected to uh, the pandemic. So do you have a plan for a dollar amount or a, a budgeting plan for how you would like the Board of Trustees to designate the use of the remaining funds? We are, our focus is to make sure that our campus uh, continue to do, be able to run the campus. Um, with, uh, as you know, we, we've taken uh, kind of a big hit on our two-year schools. Um, yes. And um, we're hoping, as I stated in my, in my revenue, that the city council and, your, and your, your, your committee advocates for us to get some of those resources back. And if we get some of those resources back, then we'll be able to use some of those resources to reinvent, reinvest in, in the university, which is, we believe is the best use of those funds. Um, how those dollars get, will get allocated depends on how each individual college's um, budget situation, um, uh, the challenges they have connected to the budget situation, uh, you know, in this fiscal year and in the next fiscal year. Okay, so uh, the Board of Trustees at their June 7th meeting approved CUNY's proposal to spend down the federal stimulus funds. Mm -hmm. Can you give us more information about that proposal? Yeah, so some of that proposal, uh, 47 million is gonna to go to student support and retention. 5.7 million is gonna go for the opening clause. 140, 105 million is gonna to go towards covering project revenue losses. 1.9 million for mental health services for our students. 3 million for online programs and development. 1.7 million there for faculty and professional development. And then the remaining 77 million, we're, uh, we're waiting for plans from the campuses in terms of how those, those funds get used. So you're waiting for plans from the campus and who are the personnel that will be involved in making those decisions for how their campus? Who is the president relying on uh, to help us? Maybe Dr. Lemons, you can tell us who you're relying on to help you at your school. So the, the primary group would be the president's cabinet, where you have the, the vice president for admin and finance, uh, but also in there you have represented student affairs, academic affairs, and, and all the different parts of the campus that need to be taken care of. Uh, facilities is, has been a huge one, uh, and just making sure that facilities are upgraded and, you know, things that we, we talked about before, for instance, right. at Lehman, you know, we redid all the bathrooms who touched us, you know, that, so those kinds of things, you know, were done and managed through uh, admin and finance and facilities. 
but that's the primary group that would vet. But you know, that's that's based then on a larger campus plan. Uh, Hector mentioned that earlier, and that that group really had all the campus constituencies represented. So to be clear, how much federal funding are the senior colleges receiving in stimulus aid? Uh, about, about 563 million. Okay. And, then, and uh, the two year schools, 242. Say that again with- 242 million. For? The two year schools. Two year schools, okay, thank you. And if you could, um, the information which you gave us, we could get that. It's probably in your in your testimony now. The yeah. proposal for the spend down. Thank you so much. And oh, there was something in your testimony, uh, Mr. Batista. Would you talk about where did I write it? The program that helps staff members to improve their skills in online teaching academic, the Ac teaching academy, I think you called it. I think that was in the dance. That, that was right. in my comments, right. Okay, Dr. Lemons, you talked about the teaching academy. I'm interested in that. You talked about uh, how professors, instructors are using that. You know, I know, I have been told that there was a, mm, in a resistance or lack of interest and in using the digital. And now we had the pandemic, so we were forced into that. So open source materials, will there be an impact then on reducing the cost of using textbooks? Are instructors really going to come together and collaborate and use those kinds of online resources? Will that have an impact on saving our students those the phenomenal costs, exorbitant costs for textbooks? Well, I, I love that question because to me that this is the opportunity we have right now. You're right. Yes. I mean, there was, you know, if we tried to force everybody to do what happened, right. we'd never succeed, right? right. <laughs> we'd never succeed. But what we had is a situation where everybody just had to. And, had to. you know, I think that even though there might be resistance initially, but I think, I think a lot of instructors found out that these are some great tools available to them and they can really help student learning by using these tools. And you know what, I, I feel we have this window of opportunity right now that we're in where, okay, all the students are used to it and all the instructors have been using these tools. Now, we don't wanna drop them. We wanna keep using right. them and developing them. And that's why I think this professional training is so important because a lot of ways we've just scratched the surface in what we can do mm -hmm. and we can do a lot better. And you probably heard, we all heard, there's a very mixed student experience around being remote, right? Some of it was great, some of it was not so great. And that's all around learning to do it better. And we, what we've got to do is build on that. And, and I feel like, you know, in the, on the academic side, this is a huge opportunity because these resources can really help students. It's not to say that in-person isn't important. In-person is very important. And even those digital things help in-person but they certainly help students when they're not on campus, when they need to access uh, resources and uh, you know, the open education resources and developing that. I feel like this is an opportunity to really expand that. And if we do, that will really bring down costs for students for, for the out of class, you know, the beyond tuition costs that they have paid. Right, right. In terms of now, again, making sure that we maximize the uh, digital learning platforms and keep, keep the instructors using that. Are there any kind of carrots that are being given to them? Because you know, it's easy to fall back. You know, we get on our diets <laughs> and the first six months we're great. And then, you know, we relapse, go back. So are there carrots that are being offered to entice them to, to maintain and improve and expand? what they've learned and how to use those resources? Yes, we, we, the plan is really to expand the, the training and the opportunities for faculty to, to build their skills. And we, you're right, there have to be incentives. And so at the very minimum, what we're doing with those is we're offering uh, faculty some compensation for their time mm -hmm. to, to do that. And that's important to do that. 
Um, so yes, I mean, we've got to build that dynamic in, but we really want to see that happen. Continue, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I think if you just add up the numbers that I mentioned and what we've done so far, it's, it's well over 3,000 faculty members have been involved in some mm -hmm. form of them. Well, that's a high percentage, but we, need to, we want to keep moving that up. Right. And, and just a few more questions before uh, we see if there are other council members. You talked about childcare, and I believe you mentioned it would benefit 1,600 students across the campuses. Right. Accommodations. In terms of returning and opening and distance requirements, again, as you say, they're being relaxed. We understand that. What is the opportunity here for us to expand financing for these childcare centers and other opportunities for children to be cared for while their parents are were at school? It's a great question. I mean, one of the reasons of, of a number of important reasons we really want to get these child care centers fully open for the fall, um, not only, of course, primarily so that we can help our students, right. but also um, we have state and federal funding that comes to these centers, and we didn't want to see that interrupted because that is very, very important in helping those centers to run. It really uh, provides a, a a lot of subsidy for their operation. So that's one of the ways that those centers are able to operate um, in an affordable way for students. In terms of expanding, um, I suppose that one of, the, one of the challenges we face there is just physical space. Um, and again, I can talk more directly at Lehman. We have a fairly new child care center. You, you might have seen it when you yes, visited I did. campus. Yeah. yeah, I think you probably yeah. So, you know, that, that's a very nice new facility, but of course it's got a finite amount of space. Right. And Thank you. I'm going to cut right there because one of my council members has been uh, very patient, been on the line. So I'm going to defer. I'm going to ask Amy to expand it now to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members with questions and the orders that they have raise their hands using the hand function in Zoom. Um, I'd also like to remember, remind everyone that questions are reserved for council members. And we'll begin now with council member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And Chair Barron, thank you so much. I appreciate your giving me a chance to ask questions. Um, the meeting starting at noon. But, uh, and, and these will be quick. And frankly, Chair Barron, I, you were exactly in the line of questioning that I have. So um, not sure I'm adding too much, but thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for the awesome hearing that you're holding. Um, just real quickly, I guess, um, you know, when so much money is involved, right? You're getting so hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal uh, government. It's hard, it's hard to keep track of it. And it, it really genuinely is. And, um, you know, when you wanna know that it's getting to the students, um, it, it's hard to figure that out whether or not it actually, you know, if you have hundreds of millions of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars get to students and, you know, sort of setting aside the 1% for overhead. Um, so I guess rather than say, I have X hundreds of millions and with that we can serve this many students, can we start with do you know what the real demand is? How many people at CUNY now would not be able to come back unless the federal money is there for them, for them to come back, right? Are we talking tens of thousands of students and then once you have sort of that number, 
how much money do you have available and do you meet 100% of demand? And if the answer is we meet 80% of demand, that's fine, whatever it is. But do you even, do you have a sense of that? I could start to respond to that, uh, Hector, if you, if you want. Um, um, one of the, sure. Go ahead. So one of the things that I think I mentioned this in my opening comments is that we did a survey uh, last year to try to understand how students were being impacted by COVID, we found 40% of them had lost their jobs. So there's one, there's one starting point on, you know, who needs aid? Well, we know for sure at least those 40 per students, 40% of students did. We also know that a lot of those jobs have still not come back. So there's a high percentage that need it. We also know how many students have received direct aid from what came through from the federal stimulus packages. And and the first for CARES Act, it was 118 million that went directly to students. Again, if you could try to talk apples to apples. So 40% of students lost their jobs. How many people is, uh, is that? And then X hundreds of millions went to students. How many people is that? Just, I know it's hard, but if you could do apples to apples, because otherwise it just sort of goes in one ear and out the other. I don't understand what you're saying, well, really. I suppose, I guess 40%, I'm doing the math quickly in my head here, but I think that's around 120, 130,000 students um, of, the, of the students that are in degree granting programs. Of course, we have many students that are- 130 in students have lost their jobs, meaning making it harder for them. Yeah. We don't know impossible, but harder. And and you've gotten in total how much to give in direct aid? So uh, far it's been 118 million, million from it was 118 million from the CARES Act and another 118 million which just recently was distributed from So Minnesota. 240 million. How yeah. many people does that serve? Is it 130,000 students? Uh, we have it, was about a, it was about 100. I mean, I think of the $230 million that we've given out, we probably it's about 150,000 students. 150. Okay. I mean, and by the way, uh, by the way, Councilwoman, we, we're, we're in our website, we're mandated to, to report out how the stimulus dollars are. are I mean, you know, so is OMB mandated to tell the federal government how they're spending the money. That is a mandate of federal money. You're you're required to show how you spend it. It's always the devil is always in the details in terms of do you show it in a way that the public can understand or do you show it in a technical you know, works for federal OMB sort of way. You know what I mean? Well, I mean we show it the way the federal government wants us to. That's to right. That's right. That's concerning. Um, well, I don't know about that. I think we're we're meeting the mandate that is required by 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 the federal government. I, don't, I would we, say you. We could disagree on that. Um, who's going to be involved in oversight of the federal? funds, um, given that local campuses are coming up with their own plans? Who's doing oversight on that? Well, ultimately, is the, the chancellor, the CEO. Um, it's presented to the Board of tr Trustees for approval on how the funds get distributed. And our, our chief financial officer puts together the reports. The and, one thing, uh, Councilwoman, yeah. you know, the, the funds don't come as a grant. They, they are, they're reimbursement based. And so there's detailed reporting that's done quarterly from every campus in which every expenditure has to fit in with an approved federal category. So the, the, the accounting is very, very detailed and accurate for, from coming from every campus and submitted to the central administration. Yeah, so we, we can redeploy dollars that are earmarked for a particular area. That's just the way it's, it's been laid yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, it all sounds rosy. 
um, when I hear from students that they can't attend, and and really what you just said, the hundred and fifty thousand sounds rosy um, compared to one hundred and thirty thousand, you know. But I don't know, you know, when I hear from students that they had to drop out, they weren't covered, right? They didn't make it as part of the 150. So I don't know the details intimately. I just need you to know that there are students who um, can't come back and students who can't get housing, students who are still trying to take care of their families and students who, you know, have too much on their plate and that I hope CUNY is doing all it can to, um, to go out of your way for these students, I, I, you know. Well, I can assure you, Councilwoman, that the, 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 the Chancellor is doing that. I mean, he, he put together, put together the, the yeah. Chancellor. I, I mean, if you could show the that in a the way that was meaningful, I, I would understood. believe but you, me, but there are too puts, many students who are tweeting at me, who are emailing me, who are calling me, saying that they're not getting it. So the, the divide is wide. And I guess what I would do, if you, if you really are so confident about this, um, I would ask you to stay on when the Student Senate representative on the Board of Trustees when she speaks, mm -hmm. if you were actually able to answer her questions and to respond to her with a straight face when she tells you about the other students and not just give some sort of blanket, you know, ambiguous statement, that, that would show something. Um, oh. But it's certainly not, what I'm hearing from students is, is uh, the demand is overwhelming. And I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying it's a slam dunk, you know, y'all are doing God's work, but, uh, but this is part of the job is meeting all of these students needs and meeting the moment. Thank you very much for giving me that time, Chair Barron. Uh, you're welcome, Councilmember Rosenthal. And to follow up just briefly, in your presentation, I think Dr. Maybank, you spoke about BMI and you spoke about ASAP. And I thought I heard you ref refer to a welcome back program, which I thought I heard you say reclaims students. So is that a, a way that we can uh, find out quantitatively how students were able to be supported in their need for finances. And, and we've often said it would be helpful to have some kind of survey tool which captures at, a at the end of a semester whether a student intends to return or if there are issues or if a student does not return, what is the cause? What are the reasons for that student's not returning? And if we had that kind of database, I think that the ASAP program that you mentioned, Welcome Back, could be specifically targeted to that population which said in their survey that these were the issues that what they were facing that might interfere with their continuing their education. Chairperson Barron, I do believe that that is doable, certainly, and we can um, provide that information to you if we are able to collect it this, this time around, but certainly going forward can uh, create a plan to do that. But what I wanted to, what I wanted to point out for um, Councilperson Rosenthal also is that the money goes to the, the money that has been distributed, the 118 from the CARES and the 118 from Caressa goes directly to the students. And so I had given the range of awards of $600 up to $1,000, and it may have been a little more for some, but there's a formula that we use to look at the circumstance for the students. The money goes directly to them. The circumstances of the pandemic have resulted in families, and those include student families, having to make really hard decisions. So they're getting the money, but then the choice has to be made about how it is spent. And there is nothing that causes that money to automatically 
go to paying the outstanding bills that are associated with their education. It yeah. may have to go to medication and to housing and to those other things as well. So that's, that, that is a part of what we're facing. And I realize that it is serious and dire. So we can check in with those we are looking to reclaim in this effort and find out what kept them from re-enrolling, kept them from coming back and now has afforded them the opportunity to do so. Because our hope is making certain that people know that there is another round of stimulus money coming that that might encourage enrollment. So yes, we-, we and, 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 and Councilwoman, I just wanna respond back to your comment. Uh, Trustee Giovanni has not only meets with me, meets with the chancellor, meets with members of the cabinet, including our chief financial officer. Where we, we have discussions connected to, and where we do look at, uh, we're here because of the mission of this organization, uh, mission of CUNY, and we take that extremely seriously. So the notion that we would not, you know, look at someone with a straight face is, is not, a, not, a, not a notion that, uh, you know, we, I'm going to let that out there because I think that our chancellor um, not only ran a two-year school, ran a four-year school, is extremely committed to the mission of this organ, of, of the university. And we are all share in that, in that vision. And uh, sometimes resources are limited and the way the resources come to us come in a way that doesn't allow us the flexibility that we like. And the chancellor, because of that, went out and done a lot of fundraising to make sure that we, we you know, we, we get resources for students that can, are not covered under the stimulus plan. Obviously, dollars don't stretch as far as we would like, and there will be students that will be left out. And that's unfortunate. It's something we constantly work on. But the notion that we don't take this, you know, extremely serious, it's not a notion that I want to leave out there. We are, we, we are committed. The reason we do this is because we're committed to the mission of, 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 of the system, and it's a great mission. And our students, are the, it's at the forefront of all of it. I guess, you know, Chair Barron, if I may, just for another minute. Sure, yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Maybank, I really appreciate the way you connected the dots. Mm -hmm. um, it helps one understand the realities. So I appreciate that. Um, do you think that uh, do you do you think that given your point about all the different things that CUNY students are juggling, do you think that they know also about um, how to get like the you know there's federal relief money coming through for rent, for example? Like, do they know about, are they helping? I mean, it's horrible that they're the conduit, but they are. Do you know that they have access to that as well? So the, the resource centers that I mentioned in my testimony are designed to be available to students to, to lay that out for them. A lot of things happen in that peer-to-peer -peer relationship where someone says, well, I was able to do such and such. And they share that information so I think it's critical for us to push as much information yeah. on as many platforms through as many mechanisms as possible so that they can share information amongst themselves. And we are on point from the student affairs perspective to make certain we're connecting them to the things that are important. So like SNAP eligibility and us pushing that information out mm -hmm. to make certain students new. You may now be eligible. Forget what was going on. You may now be eligible. Additionally, we have to be able to say through our resource centers, you may need to go and see someone at legal aid. Let's get you connected to them. When we had the resources for rent um, uh, forgiveness through May, making certain that they knew about all of that. So yeah, I think there are ways that we do it. Can we do more? Always, always. Because as I said, we have amazing students with, who are living amazing lives and we need them making amazing contributions. So we have to do everything we can to ensure that. Well, I, the feedback I'm getting is you meet with the students on a regular basis I, I and that they really, really appreciate you very, very much. I mean, then um, do you feel or um, 
I, I just think it, I, uh, Chair Barron, I'll give it back to you. I don't mean to be yammering on, but, but I think the most powerful thing we just heard, uh, or I just heard in the last 10 minutes or so, is just this notion that people are getting, um, you know, grants of 600 to a thousand dollars. And that, that is surely not enough. Um, to, to cover the shortfall in these people's lives. And um, I'm glad to know that, that there are resource centers that can help people get access to other funding. Um, that's very powerful. Um, could, Chair Barron, uh, um, do you have a clear sense? Uh, um, I shouldn't be asking you this. I will ask you afterwards, but you know, I just hope we really, I, I think we could have more transparency about how the money is being spent, what it's being spent for, and what the demand is. Um, I think the demand is a lot higher than, um, than I was aware. And um, there, we have to figure out a way to articulate it so we can advocate for the CUNY students the best we can. Um, but thank you, Chair Barron. I always appreciate you. You're very welcome. And thanks you for uh, your appointed questions as well. Uh, I will turn it now back to the host. Thank you, Chair. Chair Barron, if you don't have any further questions, we're going to move on to the uh, public portion of the time. I do have more questions. Well, Not many, we just one or two. <laughs> First of all, when we not the first one's not a question, it's a comment. When we return to free tuition, many of these problems will be uh, removed, addressed, and not as pressing for a large student population. You know, that's been my rallying cry, uh, and it was the rallying cry of the representative here before me, return to free tuition. That's the reason that I was able to get through college and just have to at that time worry about books, which were a nominal cost, transportation, food, and the 15 cent token with the Y in the middle. So we want to get back to that. Yes, that, that was something way back when. But the last question that I have is, what are you doing to address the mental health needs of staff and faculty at schools, at, at our campuses? Um, <clears throat> well. Our, our, um, our HR department has, uh, in, uh, in, in conjunction with a company that we have um, been working with, is, we'll, we'll be offering to our faculty and staff um, services connected to, uh, to be able to deal with the challenges that we all are facing, right? We all have faced challenges connected to the pandemic. I think our chancellor, and I'll defer that to Dan and, and, and Denise, our chancellor has made it a, a very important point to really um, get colleges to really focus on mental health and it's been a priority uh, of his and has allocated resources to make sure that students have services connected to, to, to mental health. Uh, I'm happy to share with you and send you the information connected to work that we're, be, we're doing. Uh, okay. with uh, faculty and staff, um, more than happy to, to send you that right. information. So I had referenced um, the tools that we were able to purchase with the $5 million um, allocation from the CARES mm -hmm. Act funds. Yeah. So the crisis text line is open to any, anyone from CUNY. So mm -hmm. it's not just student related. Um, so among those 500 conversations that I referenced, there could have been faculty and staff in the mix of that. Oh, okay. People using the 10 minute mind tool mm -hmm. is another way that they could, um, again, you know, it's relaxation, it's, it's mindfulness, it's all of those things. And anyone can use that as well. So the investment is focused on students, but available to others in those okay. particular tools. All right, I'm glad you I clarified add, that. I thought it was for students, so it's good to know it's that it's students not only, limited. It's, yeah, students. It's also, okay. Okay. Chair Barron, I could add a little bit more in terms of just faculty. We, we did launch new trainings, uh, mental health trainings on Blackboard. Okay. Um, and that, you know, that's our learning management system that faculty and students use, but we launched new modules on that 
Um, and it was focused on faculty and staff because I think, you know, we, we're, we're acutely aware of what students have been through, but we also, we all hear very directly from faculty and staff about the stress that, you know, the last 16 months have been. Thank you. And you, you prompted another question for me as we talk about um, using Blackboard, what is the status now of CUNY's program that allows for auditing of classes for, I believe, senior population at no cost? Is that still in policy? How is that message, message uh, shared? And what has been the participation? Have we, uh, do we have a tool to measure what that has been? Particularly now really when people are, are having all these other kinds of mental pressures, they may just want to take something just to elevate themselves mentally, spiritually, and not necessarily following uh, a skills development. Right, right. It's a really good question. And I'd have to get back to you to really tell you, you know, okay. the, those statistics that you're interested in. I think I, I'd be really interested in knowing myself what those are, because I, I don't know, but I can get back to you. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate your coming and uh, I wish you all good health, great opening in the fall semester and continue to serve the population that we are, we are required to serve and that expect our best, best efforts. And I will turn it now back to our host, Ms. Briggs. Thank you, Chair Barron. We have concluded the administration testimony and we will now turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a number of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few seconds delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Juvante, Giovanni Picant, Chair of the University Student Senate, Moju Baulu Okome, University Faculty Senate, and Diana Cruz of the Hispanic Federation. I will now call on Giovanni Picant to begin her testimony. Time starts now. Greeting. Greetings, member of the Public Higher Ed Committee. My name is Giovanni Piquant. I am the chairwoman of CUNY University Student Senate and member of the CUNY Board of Trustees. I would like to extend my thank you to Council Member Inez Barron for being a fierce advocate and strong advocate for CUNY and holding this oversight hearing regarding returning back to campus. As we've known, this past year has been strenuous on our students, and it does seem like we are approaching the light at the end of the tunnel returning back to campus. But that doesn't mean that all of our issues are fixed already. We do know that there are many discrepancies and issues and conversations that are occurring. The first thing I would like to talk about is a little bit of the vaccination and CUNY's efforts to promote vaccination to our students. And we have here heard from the administration, vaccinations will be required for students who will be taking in-person classes. Um, exemptions are going to be eligible if granted to people as well. And also testing will be happening. But I think my concern as a student and ensuring that, and I have stresses to this administration, and they have been very receptive in regards to ensuring despite a student vaccinated or not, if a student does have a negative COVID test, they can still be granted the resources they need to succeed. When we talk about basic needs, as our vice chancellor, Denise Mavink loves to speak about technology, food pantries, seeing your mental health counselor on campus. Those are basic and vital needs that have most of the times been stripped away from our students were not easily accessed. I must say I applaud CUNY for its effort to continuing the food pantries throughout the pandemic that we have seen where students were able to come on campus to collect bag groceries, partnering up with community organizations to ensure that we are consistently helping our students. But that also helped with our student government and our student leaders across CUNY who would come out and volunteer every other week to make that happen. And I think it speaks to the true testament of what we are as an institution, getting back to the basics of what we need as essential resources. One of the most pivotal issues that we are going to see when we enter the fall and one of my top concerns and students' concerns are mental health, the mental health of our staff, mental health of our students, especially for our Black 
students and our students of color. This is something that must have an attentional approach when we approach into the fall and it cannot operate as business per usual. I do believe our institution, we cannot operate as this, it's a blanket fix. We must have inst intentional efforts to help fix intentional issues. And I do think it's the administration's duty to see how they're going to tackle that, but also incorporating the voices that are close to the issue to be part of the solution-driven conversations that we are going to be having. I stress our faculty of color, our Black faculty, our students of color, our Black students, and also our staff as um, well, who are part of those communities. I do think it is very important for us not to just stray away and know that we do have resources and federal stimulus funds going into what's happening. I do think council member Ines Barron has stressed the importance of transparency and us understanding where these funds are going, but also including people who are going to be recipient of these services that communities are thinking about implementing are a part of the conversation. I do stress our administration to have a more transparent approach, but more digestible way of delivering this information to the CUNY community on a more consistent and regular basis. I do see that there are going to be a lot of shifts in the fall, but I do stress our administration to continue to be more transparent, but also ensuring that the information is digestible. Lastly, we do know that we have proposed cuts to CUNY. Um, and I cannot end my testimony without speaking about these proposed cuts to CUNY. And I know we have some of our council members on that call, on this call here today. And it is extremely important that this money um, that are proposed to be cut, um, that is not. We have a group of students who are gonna be coming back into the fall. We have post COVID recovery. And it's important to stress that the pandemic is still here. And part of New York City's lifeline is CUNY. You know, this is my, I can't even remember how many times I've testified in front of the council advocating, you know, for funding for CUNY, but also ensuring that we can one day go back to free tuition college that doesn't just give us free education, but a sound education. And I think the history of CUNY and what we stand for, it is time for us to meet the moment. Socially, we have an upheaval and uprising of social justice issues. And this is the perfect moment for CUNY to invest in the studies that matter, to invest in the students that matter and invest in the programs that matter, because it is extremely important. And every student that walks into any campus and halls of any CUNY institution shall and must feel that they are celebrated. With that being said, that concludes my testimony. And I look forward to working with our administration, but also our students and continue advocating and elevating the concerns of our students. Thank you, Chair Barron. Welcome. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Piquant. Uh, I will now call on Moju Baulu Okome to testify. Time starts now. Good afternoon um, to the um, Committee on Higher Education. I, um, I also uh, would like to ask, crave your indulgence, because I have an international conference that starts at one and I'm, I'm chairing the uh, panel discussion. So if I leave, it's not because I don't respect the process, but because those plans were made since last year. Um, so thank you very much for holding this hearing. I want to start with a quote from our union, PSC CUNY. A healthy and safe working environment is a right and not a privilege. I am Mujuba Olu Olufunke Okome, and I'm a professor of political science at Brooklyn College and a representative of the University Faculty Senate of CUNY. I was newly assigned to this committee, and it's a pleasure to um, have participated thus far. I see the COVID-19 pandemic, just like many other um, human beings, as unprecedented in the magnitude the impact and the long-term yet to be fully known ramifications. This pandemic has challenged us in manifold ways, including the devastating number of infections and fatalities suffered in New York City, which quickly became an epicenter of the pandemic. As a matter of fact, currently uh, our union has 50 members of our faculty and staff listed as having lost their lives during this pandemic. 
And from the CUNY site, I saw a list of four students' names, but I'm sure there are more. I myself taught students who were sick and who lost family during this pandemic. So this has been a pandemic that shook us all in many ways. I have um, I've submitted my written remarks because they're quite lengthy and I wouldn't be able to cover everything. But one of the things that's important to us as faculty is safety as a top priority. We have to make sure that when we return to campus in the first way that is logical, that we do so in as safe as possible a manner while still providing remote options for people who are not able to join in that move because they have health concerns and they have disabilities that don't allow them to join. So we're also you know, interested. Oh, my time has expired. So let me quickly go to the bullet points in terms of what um, we'd like to see. Yes, what I just want to we... say, you can continue your remarks. You've been patient and waiting and you do have another event, so you can continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the priority areas for, uh, for us are the health, security and safety of all members of the CUNY community in a way that proactively and transparently plans and responds to the COVID-19 challenges that we face. Job security for adjunct faculty and staff is also very important. Some of our colleagues have been laid off and this was in a time when everybody's lives were really in, uh, in turmoil. Uh, we believe that it is not equitable to do so. And some of the funds that are being received from the federal government, we think should be allocated to um, reincorporating these uh, members of our community back into their jobs. We also would like to have full-time um, compensation for CUNY support staff. One of the things I'd like to know actually is what plans are being made for custodial staff, because I know there were cuts before the pandemic. So what are we doing to ensure that we have enough custodial staff to keep up with the intensive cleaning that is required under COVID conditions? We also need assistance for our indigent students. We need our students to have help to pay their fees for help to access education in whatever modalities are required for healthcare uh, assistance to them, inclusive of mental health care. We need for us to be able to give them academic support that would enhance their chances of succeeding, excelling and graduating. We also need to maintain levels of cleanliness and ventilation that would meet CDC health standards and other health standards that are best practices. We need funding and support for our ethnic studies departments and programs. A lot of them are underfunded and they're struggling. Um, we also need to hire and retain more uh, BIPOC faculty and staff. This is black, indigenous um, and ethnic communities, you know. The funds from the federal government, we think should be used for some for these purposes and other things I mentioned in my report that I couldn't get to. Um, an investment in CUNY is an investment in not only knowledge creation that educates our students and the community at large. It's a solid contribution to preparing our students to successfully engage and compete in a rapidly changing world. CUNY is involved in building human capital and has been noted to be a powerful engine of socioeconomic mobility in our city, state, and country, and in the world, I would say. Now more than ever, it should be adequately funded and it should be given the material conditions that it needs to succeed in its mission, in its vision, and in meeting its core values. How we organize our return 
to our various campuses is an important part of building back better. We have to commit to intersectional equity, to socially conscious planning, and anti-racist education in all aspects of the strategies and policies that we embrace in this process. And I would like to draw attention also to a lot of the work that PSC CUNY has done to make suggestions and recommendations on things that we need in order to foster equity and embrace anti-racist education. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Diana Cruz to testify. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Committee Chair Barron and all other committee members for allowing me to present this testimony on behalf of the Hispanic Federation. The greatest number of undergraduate Latino students across New York State attend CUNY colleges. As the largest urban public university, offering many opportunities such as affordable quality education, there is no doubt as to why many Latino students enroll in CUNY institutions. Moreover, while the college enrollment has been on the decline for years across the US, Latinx students have been enrolling at exponential rates. However, the coronavirus pandemic is forcing many of them to decide between staying in school and working to help their families survive the economic fallout. We are concerned about the many students that won't return this fall. And in CUNY's case, enrollment dropped more than 5% in the fall of 2020. And although the city's in full reopening mode, students and families continue to navigate uncertainty and lack of access to basic needs. Many students had had to put their education on the back burner as they worry about their jobs, housing and families. The recovery of New York depends on our students' future and we must allocate the necessary supports to reopen strongly and fairly. Thus, the Hispanic Federation urges the council to advocate for the restoration of 77 million for CUNY, ensure that the funding cuts for ASAP for the ASAP program are rectified, stop the tuition increases and ensure the federal funding is allocated equitably. A full funding budget for CUNY is critical to reopen campuses effectively and the best interests of students. The funding can offer food services, mental health supports, tutoring to re-engage with academics, faculty support, faculty retention, and much, much more. This is not the time to de-invest in our students' education, and we request that the council prioritizes funding that will provide better and better, better opportunities for college students that are the key to, the brighter, uh, to a brighter New York City. CUNY students are among the populations that experience and continue to face challenges during the pandemic. According to survey data, 80% of students have lost their household income, 50% reported losing access to food, and overall many has shown high anxiety and depression signs. An equitable and just reopening of the city must prioritize the immediate and long-term needs of our students. This includes the hiring of mental health experts that can assess and provide social emotional supports, that continue to invest in college success programs that focus on transition from high school to college and from community colleges to four-year institutions, increase financial aid resources and address the tuition costs across CUNY, while also addressing the basic needs as mentioned before in terms of food access. And finally, I definitely wanna address the need for a faculty um, to be higher and retain our institutions. I thank you for your time and reemphasize how critical it is to focus on these priorities for the benefit of many students and communities as we envision a stronger New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn to Chair Barron for questions for this panel. Thank you very much to the panel for your testimony. I don't have any questions, but I do want to encourage you and to let you know that I, I support your comments, uh, I support your efforts, and look forward to continuing to work with you to achieve those things that we know are in the best interest of the CUNY community, wherever they're located. And I want to commend uh, Giovanni, Picant, Giovanni Picant for her tribute, her honor. She was recognized at the 20th Annual Juneteenth Program as an outstanding person. And we want to acknowledge that, as well as was Timothy Hunter, who received uh, acknowledgement, and Professor uh, Arthur Lewin from Baruch College. So they were part of a group of people who were honored. 
and we want to acknowledge that and commend them. Thank you. Back to our moderator. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on the next panel. To, and this panel in order of speaking will be James Davis, President of PSC, Jean Grassman, Co-Chair of the Health and Safety of Health and Safety Watchdogs, Dr. Diane P. Banks, member of PSC, Roxanne Shirazai, member of PSC, and Andrea, Andrea Vasquez, first vice president of PSC. I will now call on James Davis to testify. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Barron and uh, committee members. It's good to be with you. I'm James Davis. I'm the president of the Professional Staff Congress. And as you know, we represent CUNY's 30,000 faculty and professional staff. I'm joined by Andrea Vasquez, PSC First Vice President, Professor Jean Grassman from our School of Public Health, Professor Diane Banks from Bronx Community College, and Professor Roxanne Shirazi from the Graduate Center. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss some of the challenges that are facing our members. Chair Barron, let me start by thanking you and your colleagues on the committee for your steadfast support for CUNY. Even as the mayor has proposed sharp sharper budget cuts than any in recent memory. You have pushed for restorations and for additional funding. You've consistently highlighted CUNY as an economic engine and advocated that CUNY will only overcome years of racist austerity through recurring investment that's gonna help put the city on the path to recovery, so thank you. My colleagues and I would like to highlight some of the key challenges facing our workforce and we seek your support. So to be safe, our transition back to in-person work needs to be gradual and it needs to be handled with transparency. We love our students and our mission. That's what gets us going every morning, but we love our families too. And so our health is paramount. Transparency from our administration will not only build confidence among faculty and staff in the safety of the workplace, it will make safety possible will be able to ask informed questions and request remediation of facilities that require it. We will not send our members into unsafe offices, labs, or classrooms. We have taken steps to minimize risks to our members. We developed clear safety standards so members can follow the science. We negotiated a remote work agreement with CUNY so that staff who can perform their jobs effectively offsite may continue to do so. We negotiated a pre-occupancy walkthrough protocol so that PSC representatives can accompany engineers and administrators, checking ventilation and other key indicators. Our health and safety committee has trained nearly 150 members to conduct those walkthroughs with management. And we undertook a campaign to free federal stimulus funds from bureaucracy at the state and university level so that repairs and upgrades could be completed before we return in large numbers. Nevertheless, we're concerned because many facilities have suffered from years of neglect and deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. CUNY's record in this regard has been uneven, sometimes dismal or even dangerous. Many of us want to return to campus, but we need vigilance from the administration, not here and there, but on each campus and in every facility. I'm CUNY's excited. target. Uh, may I please have 30 seconds to complete my remarks? Yes, you may, certainly. Thank you. CUNY's target to return staff to in-person work is August 2nd. We do not know when each college's reopening plan will be approved. And although the process must not be rushed, delays to the approvals could also require delays to reopening in order to accommodate walkthroughs with union members present. CUNY must provide our members with accurate data and timely responses to questions and concerns. Your support in the oversight process is deeply appreciated. We thank you for your continued efforts on our behalf. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Jean Grassman to testify. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you to the Committee on Higher Education and specifically thank you to Chair Barron for hearing us today. Um, I'd like to call out three principles that should guide CUNY in, um, in a healthy and safe return of the entire university community. 
The first is CUNY should employ multiple strategies aimed at minimizing the spread of COVID. The pandemic is not over as much as we would like that to be the case. And it's because continued precautions are necessary because the campus community will be a mixed population in terms of vaccination status. And this is due to individual choice, religious reasons and health. New variants of the coronavirus continue to emerge and spread. Just yesterday, a, a spike in hospitalizations in Missouri was attributed to the Delta variant. Lastly, we do not know how long vaccinations will be effective. Those of us lucky enough to have been vaccinated early in the spring may find ourselves susceptible once again in October, the middle of the fall semester. The second point or principle about CUNY reopening is that it needs to be based on the science. Authoritative sources have disseminated compelling evidence that COVID-19 is spread through aerosols, which can disperse through distances and accumulate over time. College campuses are uniquely vulnerable because of the time spent in crowded classes where speakers can release large quantities of droplets and aerosols. Examples of situations where the science is not being considered include, CUNY has asked campuses to develop plans for three foot distancing without a corresponding plan as to whether the ventilation will be sufficient. This spring, CUNY distributed a memo where they referred to ASHRAE 62.1 as the authoritative standard for indoor ventilation. In fact, ASHRAE's own epidemiologic task force urged abandonment of the use of 62.1 as it is intended for energy conservation and not adequate for reducing airborne virus. We understand that CUNY has hired a consultant to do a ventilation audit. In order to be useful, that audit needs to verify ven adequate ventilation in all occupied spaces. We suspect that the ventilation audit is being done at the building level rather than the immediate environment used by our members and students. So we look forward to those reports and we are wondering when they may be available. Finally, we call on CUNY to develop a stance of pandemic re readiness. Um, in 2011, the World Health Organization said, the world is ill-prepared to respond to a severe influenza pandemic or to any similarly global, sustained, and threatening public health emergency. I'm expired. Could I have 30 seconds, please? Yes, certainly you may. Thank you. Thank you. They add that pandemic preparedness is not a plan. It's a continuous process that adapts to evolving knowledge. CUNY will say they have already, they already have an emergency response plan, but this is different. They need to develop preventative strategies. As an institution of higher education, CUNY should apply the lessons learned from the past year to protect those who work and learn here at the nation's largest public university. And I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Dr. Diana, Diane P. Banks to testify. Thanks, Dr. Snow. Peace and blessings, everyone. My name is Dr. Diane Price Banks. I come to you, I come before you as a conduit of PSC members mm -hmm. at BCC mm -hmm. who have communicated with me in my capacity as chair for the Health and Safety Committee regarding health and safety concerns on campus. Let me start by providing an example of problems pre-pandemic and during the pandemic that have created deep health and safety concerns on campus specific to ventilation and COVID-19. In 2018, Havemeyer Annex was shut down prior to the pandemic after the union highlighted poor ventilation and poor air quality, which led to employees being sick. It was well documented by members of the administration that the air quality was poor in that building, yet it took union involvement to get the building shut down. Coastal Hall was shut down due to poor heating and pipes, heating of the pipes, which caused 68 pipes to burst and flood the building in January 2020. In addition, this building is also operating with a Univent system, which brings in fresh air um, that is mixed with existing air. If working properly the mixed air is filtered heated and cooled but is not the ventilation system mm -hmm. recommended mm -hmm. by ASRAE mm -hmm. for classroom mm -hmm. capacities and thus can be a mixing ground for COVID-19 um, transmission. 
Faculty who have worked a full year on the reoccupancy committee were asked to volunteer during their 2021 contractual leave, which commenced from June 1st to August 23rd, 2021. Yet all other non-faculty members of this committee continue to be compensated. BCC administration claims that the, the total of $2,000 needed to pay faculty for services rendered during the summer was not available despite CARES Act funding being set aside for this very reason. This has caused a lack of representation of faculty on the reoccupancy committee as it relates to instructional stakeholders returning to work. Currently, due to the 60% in-person mandate by the chancellor, PSC members at BCC are being asked to return to work in buildings that do not have HVAC systems in place and asked to work with students in these very buildings. Poor ventilation is a Poor ventilation is a breeding ground for the transmission of COVID and any viral particles in the air can linger for days and be a source of infection. An alleged incident at BCC involved an employee who was positive for COVID coming to campus in the absence of sick leave time, infected others and um, resulted in South Hall, the South Hall building being closed for cleaning and disinfection. This building does not have an HVAC system, but has been occupied by employees during the pandemic. These safety concerns amongst others that my colleagues have cited or will cite, and those that Time we can expired. in three minutes. Can I have 30 seconds, please? Yes, of course, yes. Thank you so much. Um, that continue to pose a serious health and safety risk for students, faculty and staff. Therefore, we collectively recommend the following. Funding provided to aid capital projects to install and update HVAC systems in poorly ventilated buildings and buildings that do not meet the ASHRAE standards by August 2nd, 2021 are not open until they do meet these standards. Mr. As Mr. Batista stated, CUNY has commenced an intensive survey of ventilation on campuses. Therefore, we ask that these reports be made public to all CUNY employees, especially those who occupy these spaces prior to reoccupancy. And lastly, as the Chancellor man mandated all, as the Chancellor mandated all campuses to push for a 60% in-person return for the fall. And as Dr. Lemons stated, CUNY will commence a testing initiative and we'll look, and we look forward to seeing this manifested into fruition at each campus. We ask that students, faculty, and staff are not asked to return until this testing initiative is fully in place. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Roxanne Shirazi to testify. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. My name is Roxanne Shirazi, and I'm a PSC delegate and member of the library faculty at the CUNY Graduate Center. Thank you for having me. Librarians understand the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on research and teaching, and we know that reopening the libraries is an important step towards academic and intellectual normalcy. Yet we also know that before the pandemic, many of CUNY's campus libraries were in disrepair. When CUNY classes moved online in March 2020, the libraries were initially kept open and librarians reported having to bring their own hand soap to work so that they could practice proper hygiene as frontline workers. CUNY libraries are high traffic spaces where students congregate often in groups for several hours at a time and library staff work in close contact with them at service desks. CUNY library workers often have decades of experience working in these crumbling facilities. There is little faith left in general statements about a building being safe. We have learned to ask for proof. We want details about how our spaces have been prepared for a mix of vaccinated and unvaccinated people to keep our communities safe. We believe that our students deserve the same precautionary measures that are already in place at other New York City libraries. And we want to ensure that all CUNY students have equitable resource access regardless of their campus affiliation. Some materials are simply not available as ebooks, and students often prefer to use print. We must not lose sight of the urgent need to provide safe access to our library's print collections. But at my own campus, at the Graduate Center, librarians have been working for six months to restart on site services, but CUNY will not provide the information we need to do it safely. 
We've asked for details about the ventilation and are told that that data is not available because the library is closed. How are we supposed to prepare operations in spaces before we know that those spaces can be used safely? At every turn, the Graduate Center has told us to wait, to wait for policy from CUNY Central, to wait for new guidance, to wait because they just don't have the information to move forward. Yet after months of denying us this basic information, the Graduate Center suddenly moved to open a student study space in the library and gave the librarians just five working days notice. When PSC Health and Safety was finally allowed to conduct a walkthrough, we were not given access to any of the shared offices used by library staff, and CUNY's representative stated that they were not bound to any HVAC best practice recommendations. We actually had to argue that COVID-19 is a recognized hazard and that reducing indoor concentrations of the virus is achieved through improved ventilation. We should not have to fight over these simple facts. CUNY repeatedly assures workers that spaces have been checked and are safe, but they will block access to any of the details or proof that improvements have been made. When there should be community engagement and transparency, CUNY has opted for secrecy and stalling. It does not have to be this way. We are not here to catch CUNY failing. We want CUNY's reopening to succeed and to be done with care for our community so that we can reopen stronger together. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Andrea Vasquez. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I'm Andrea Vasquez, PSC First Vice President and a professional staff member at the Graduate Center. Thank you, Chairperson Barron and members of this committee for holding this hearing and for all of your work on behalf of CUNY students and by, on behalf of our union members throughout this difficult year. It's hard to adequately reply to so many points that we heard from the CUNY administration. Um, so the PSC would very much appreciate further conversations with Chair Barron and council members, especially those whose districts en encompass CUNY colleges. The main points I'd like to pick up on are about transparency and timetable. CUNY's calling back about 7,000 staff members on August 2nd, mostly two days a week to, to full-time face-to-face. Thousands more will show up when the semester starts. This is the moment that CUNY is obliged to ensure a safe return for us all, and it's an opportunity to better serve our students. It's a time to ensure that our facilities are clean and safe, showing respect and gratitude for all that students and employees have done to keep this institution alive. So we say to CUNY, tell us what your plans are. Executive Vice Chancellor said he gave guidelines to each campus. He's going back and forth with colleges to make sure the buildings meet necessary standards. Why have we not seen any of CUNY's guidelines if they want this to work? Why have we not seen what the companies they have hired have discovered and determined? Why has CUNY not told us when college reopening plans will be approved, when they will inform us which buildings will be used? Why aren't they scheduling walkthroughs now if they want their plan to work? The executive vice chancellor told us that he has the information on how we will keep our colleges clean. In many instances, this will be for the first time. Great. Why hasn't he given that plan to the stakeholders, the people who will inhabit those spaces? So we ask, how is withholding all of this information helpful and efficient if they intend to open at 60, 50 to 60 percent capacity on August 1st, on August 2nd? How is withholding that information respectful to the employees who have worked their hearts out all year long and held up the university for our students? Mental health issues were raised earlier today. First, I would like to thank Chairperson Barron for asking about the mental health of our members. Help with relaxation and mindfulness, as we heard, are wonderful. But those things do not help when our contractual workload is ignored when there's fear of job loss or retaliation, and when professional development opportunities are few and far between. And on mental health for our students, during the peak of the pandemic, CUNY gave inadequate funds to colleges and told them they needed to rush and spend it by June and that the funding would end. That was a disaster. Now, Executive Vice Chancellor Batista has said they've allotted $1.9 million to provide mental health services for our students. As CUNY and this committee may recall, the current ratio of mental health counselors to students at CUNY is 2,700 to one, not the 1,000 to one that's, the na that's nationally recommended. $1.9 million would allow for only 15 full-time positions, not the 125 full-time counselors, thank you, that are needed as laid out in New Deal for CUNY state, legis state legislation. Today, we've heard from students, a member of the Faculty Senate, 
PSC members and the Hispanic Federation. We share a vision and we now need CUNY to walk the walk to make sure that that vision is a reality. Be transparent. You have the funds and the power to make CUNY better. Free the funds that Congress fought so hard for to make our spaces safe and to make the hires of full-time faculty and staff to be able to meet the needs of all of our glorious students. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now turn to Chair Barron for any questions or comments. Thank you very much. I wanna thank this panel for your testimony, for your presentations. And I do believe that this may be the first time that uh, we've had testimony from James Davis, at least as president of PSC. So we want to welcome you and look forward to a continuing relationship. I'm very much concerned about the ability for PSC to be at the table as discussion is going forth about what the conditions are. I'm also very much concerned about not just saying that you've met the specifications on paper, particularly as it relates to ventilation, but what are the other factors that need to be considered? And, and I believe it was, oh my goodness, uh, was it maybe Ms. Diane Banks who talked about there are different measures, not just in the place in the immediate area, but in a larger base. So if you could just briefly talk about that for about one minute, because I do have another meeting. But you, I think you made a comparison as to meeting the qualifications in the immediacy of the uh, space as compared to another environment. Is that right? So I think that was Jean Grassman, but we oh, um, okay. did point out that it was a six um, AC, ACH units that has to be in each space to make sure that there's adequate ventilation. Okay. In the area. Okay, great. That's so those are the kinds of things that it's helpful uh, for me to get information on because you can say, oh yes, this unit is great, it's working, but you may need more. That may not be sufficient for the space that you're in, got it. So I, I look forward to continuing to advocate uh, on your behalf and make demands, not just on the COVID situation, but certainly on the budget on your behalf as well. And thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Briggs. Thank you, Chair Barron. We have now heard from everyone that has signed up to testify. We appreciate your time and your presence. If we inadvertently have missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raised hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order your hands were raised. All right, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Barian, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Oh, Chair, I'm sorry you are muted. Thank you, I muted myself. Thank you very much. I wanna thank all of the panelists who participated in today's hearing. I wanna thank everyone who watched virtually and for your interest in what it is that we need to do to make sure that as we go forward and get to various stages of ending this pandemic, that we don't relapse, that we don't miss signals and important um, stops and checks that we need to take along the way and that we continue to make CUNY a great institution. I wanna thank you all. I'm rushing because I'm late for it. This is the Zoom world, you know, we're wondering. So one ends and, and another begins almost simultaneously. But I wanna thank everyone for their participation and thank you very much, Ms. Briggs. Oh, I have my shake of eggs. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.